This presentation is entitled The Slave Master, and in it we will discuss the trial of John Edward Robinson, Sr. First, let's talk about the culprit of this case, or the defendant. John Edward Robinson Sr. was a 40-year-old, married, self-employed, though not very successful, entrepreneur. In the 1980s and 90s, he and his wife Nancy were living in a large mobile home in Olathe, Kansas. Uh, in 1998, he acquired a chunk of land in a remote Lynn County, Kansas area where they moved into another mobile home. By all accounts, Robinson appeared outwardly to be a normal suburban husband and father. However, it would soon be discovered that he was not the person he appeared to be. Throughout much of his adult life, he was constantly scheming and partaking in fraudulent business activities, conning numerous people out of high amounts of money along the way. He used the Internet often for business-related tasks, most, most of which involved fraud, and was also highly involved in Internet chat rooms. Infidelity had always been an issue for this couple as well, and Nancy knew that her husband had a number of mistresses throughout their marriage. It was discovered at a later point that he had a particular interest in BDSM content that he would partake in via internet chat rooms. To clarify, BDSM stands for Bondage, Discipline, Dominance, Submission, and Sadomasochism. Robinson went by the online screen name of Master, as he insisted on playing the dominant role, and had even entered into several contracts over the years with various women agreeing to be his slaves. This became one of his M.O.s for luring victims to their deaths, and as a result, by the early 2000s, he would come to be known as the Internet's first serial killer. Next, let's talk about uh, some of the victims of this case and their stories. Although there were many people who had fallen prey to Robinson's fraudulent crimes over the years, out of these there were eight specific cases that were much more personal and resulted in the tragic deaths of these victims. The first was Paula Godfrey, age 19. In 1984, she was hired by Robinson as a sales rep for a fraudulent financial consulting company that he was running and was subsequently, quote, sent out of town for training. She disappeared, never to be seen again. The second victim, Lisa Stacy, also 19 years old. In January of 1985, Lisa met Robinson at a women's shelter in Kansas City where she was staying with her four-month-old daughter, Tiffany. Robinson, pretending to be the head of an outreach program for young mothers, offered her a job, an apartment, and child care services in Chicago. After agreeing to this proposition, Lisa and baby Tiffany left with Robinson, never to be seen again. This particular case has an interesting plot turn, however, in that there was a baby involved. Robinson forged adoption documents using Lisa's signature and gave baby Tiffany to his brother and sister-in-law, who had been trying to adopt, stating that the baby's mother had left her at a shelter and committed suicide. The unsuspecting Robinson family paid him $5,000 in adoption fees and went on to raise baby Tiffany under the new name of Heather Tiffany Robinson. It wasn't until a recent DNA test proved that she was in fact the daughter of murder victim Lisa Stacy. 
The third victim was Catherine Clampett, 27 years old. In June of 87, uh, Catherine had just made a move from Texas to Kansas, and much like Paula Godfrey, she was hired by Robinson as a secretary for his, quote, successful business, with promises of extensive travel opportunities and other benefits. She also vanished shortly after her move. The fourth victim was Beverly Bonner, 49 years old. In November of 1993, Robinson had been incarcerated for fraud uh, for the previous several years. Beverly was a prison librarian in Missouri where he was being held. In getting to know her, he found out that she was receiving alimony checks from her ex-husband. He seduced her, and upon his, his release, Beverly quit her job at the prison and moved to Kansas with plans to work for him. She disappeared almost immediately after the move, but not before signing over her alimony checks to Robinson. Now at this point, um, starting between 1993 and 94, Robinson's schemes evolved from face-to-face -face interactions to online interactions, mainly using BDSM chat rooms. The fifth and sixth victims were Sheila Faith, 45-year-old single mother, and her daughter Debbie Faith, a 15-year-old disabled girl with spina bifida. They were receiving disability checks from the government. In spring of 94, Sheila met Robinson on one of these chat rooms as she was also into BDSM. In their exchanges, Robinson pretended to be a wealthy businessman. He convinced her to move to Kansas by offering to cover all medical costs for Debbie. Shortly after moving from California to Kansas to be with him, both Sheila and Debbie also disappeared. Yet for the next six to seven years, their government pension checks continued to be cashed. The seventh victim was Isabella Lewicka, a 21-year-old Polish immigrant living in Indiana. In spring of 1997, she met Robinson in an online BDSM chat room and entered into a contract with him also agreeing to be his sex slave. This slave contract involved signing over all of her property and belongings to him, as she would become his new wife, despite the fact that he was already married. In exchange, he offered her a job and an apartment in Kansas, where she moved to and lived for a couple years as his pretend wife, before also vanishing in 1999, never to be seen again. Traces of blood would later be found in her apartment that was being rented out by Robinson, with DNA testing linking the blood to her. His eighth victim was Suzette Troughton, 27 years old. In the summer of 1999, around the same time of Isabella's disappearance, Suzette, who was an LPN from Michigan, also met Robinson on a BDSM site and also entered into a slave contract with him, agreeing to travel the world with him as his submissive sex slave, while also working as a caretaker for his ailing father. Just as with the others, Suzette disappeared soon after her move to Kansas. The ninth victim, Vicki Neufeld, um, was lucky in that she came dangerously close to becoming one of his fatal victims, but she survived. Vicki, too, had met Robinson on a BDSM site where they made plans to meet up for sex at a local hotel. Because Robinson was starting to get sloppy and careless at, the, at this point, the police were beginning to suspect him and were actually surveilling him at this time. During their meeting, Robinson sexually assaulted Vicky and stole $700 worth of sex toys that she had brought with her. She went to the police with this information, and this is what gave them the probable cause they needed to obtain a search warrant and to search his premises. This ultimately is what led to the grisly discovery made on June 2, 2000, on John Edward Robinson's property, followed by his long overdue arrest. Now that we have summarized each victim's circumstance, let's move on to the defendant. Robinson was a con man involved in various fraudulent activities as well as organized sex, and he killed primarily for financial gain. He would make contact with vulnerable women all over the country from whom he believed he could somehow benefit financially. Using different aliases, he would get to know these women, romance them, and lure them in with promises of jobs, homes, travel opportunities, and sexual relations. Shortly after moving to Kansas to meet him, each woman would disappear. Each murder was committed by one or two lethal blows to the head with a blunt object, often a hammer, and each body then disposed of in a chemical barrel stored on his property. 
Also, in each case, he would continue to not only benefit financially from his victims by collecting their checks and assets, but he would also continue to correspond with their families and friends for some time after their deaths in an attempt to cover his tracks, using their phones, signatures, and online login information, which he would always obtain from them. Many of these letters and emails were questionable to families as they did not look or sound like they had been written by their loved ones, and the stories that Robinson would tell the families were always the same, that the woman had met another man and ran off with him. Yet because each woman was of legal age, there was not much that the families could do. These circumstances can be summed up in Robinson's modus operandi, which, keep in mind, is an important factor in this case. All of the crimes that resulted in murder shared four similar characteristics. One, luring of the victims in with promises of jobs, homes, travel, etc. Two, exploitation of the victims financially, sexually, and otherwise. Three, killing the victims and disposing of their bodies in a similar fashion. And four, concealing his crimes via fraud and deception. Let's move on to the discovery. On June 2nd, 2000, with a search warrant in hand, police officers raided Robinson's secluded Lynn County, Kansas home, where they found two barrels from which the coroner pulled the bodies of Suzette Troughton and Isabel Lewicka. The police then searched Robinson's storage units in Missouri, where they located three more barrels, wrapped in plastic due to the leakage, from which the coroner pulled the bodies of Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and her daughter, Debbie Faith. Unfortunately, the remaining three bodies have not been found, and Robinson refuses to disclose their locations to this day. Let's discuss the charges. On October 7, 2002, Robinson stood trial for the murders of Stacy, Lewicka, and Troughton in Johnson County, Kansas. He pled not guilty on all accounts. There were six counts against him. Count 1 for aggravated kidnapping of Troughton. Count 2, intentional premeditated murder of Troughton. Count 3, intentional premeditated murder of Lewicka. Count 4, theft of Neufeld's property. Count 5, first degree premeditated murder of Stacy. And Count 6, aggravated interference with Stacy's parental custody. Unfortunately, he was not charged for the murders of Godfrey or Clampett, as their bodies had not been found, and there was not enough physical evidence linking him to them. Okay, so let's move on to the legal system now. So based on the uh, circumstances of the case, this would be a criminal trial process. And in the um, criminal trial procedure, there are um, about 10 10 main steps, starting with arrest and interrogation. Um, with this, um, once you have probable cause and a warrant, you may go ahead and arrest, and in the case of custodial interrogation, uh, the Miranda warnings um, apply at that point. Then you have preliminary arraignment. Uh, this is the first appearance before the judge that has to happen within um, hours of the arrest. Uh, at this point, the defendant is presented with a criminal complaint, and charges are brought only by the police, and no DA involvement um, at this point yet. Then bail is set if appropriate. Um, in this case, it's, it wouldn't be appropriate due to the charges of capital murder. Then we've got the preliminary hearing, which basically asks if there is enough evidence to proceed to trial on a criminal on the criminal complaint charges. If the prosecutor meets the burden of a prima facie case in which he can state that a crime was committed and it was likely committed by this person, then the state may uh, formally file charges and a date is set for a form formal arraignment at that point. At the formal arraignment, the state files official charges against the defendant. Um, a date is set for pretrial conference and then the discovery process begins uh, by the defendant, where the defendant asks for um, all the evidence that the prosecution has. Um, then we move on to pretrial motions. Uh, most commonly, this would include a motion to suppress any evidence that might have been obtained un unconstitutionally, but some others may include motions to sever, to dismiss, or to compel discovery. Um, next is speedy trial, and this is um, under Rule 600 of the Criminal Procedure. 
If the defendant is incarcerated, then he must be brought to trial within 180 days. If he is not incarcerated, he must be brought to trial within 365 days. And any time spent in jail is excluded from the calculation. Then we have pre-trial conferences, and this is basically the judge's final meeting with both the defense and the prosecution to review the plan, and it is also the last chance to settle or to make a plea bargain um, before the trial begins. Then we move on to the trial, which is basically the show of the whole thing, and this also includes a lot of different steps like opening instructions to the jury, opening statements, prosecution's case in chief with a, a cross-examination, and then the defense's case also with cross-examination, then the closing arguments, closing instructions to the jury, and then jury deliberation. And then the final phase of the criminal trial process is the verdict and the consequences. Um, once the jury has uh, reached a unanimous decision, which they have to reach uh, in order for a decision to be made, then the verdict is read in open court and the jury is dismissed. If the verdict is guilty, as in it was the case in this crime, the defendant has a choice to appeal this, this verdict. During sentencing, both the defendant and the victims or the families of the victims have an opportunity to, to speak. Um, in the case of first or second degree murder, this is an automatic life imprisonment without parole and also the possibility of the death penalty. Moving on to attorney roles. Uh, we are first going to discuss the role of the prosecution in this case. And the role of the prosecution um, is to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant Robinson committed these crimes. And when we're looking at this, we're looking at the elements of the case. Um, A plus MS uh, causing R minus D equals L. So uh, the A in this case, the actus reus, is the murder that was committed, plus the mens rea, uh, which was the defendant's premeditation and intent to kill for financial gain, gain um, resulted in, by direct causation, the victim's deaths, minus no defenses that he had, um, equals his liability, which is that he is fully guilty of these murders. And there is an overwhelming amount of evidence for the prosecution. Um, the main goal for them was to obtain the death penalty. And these are just some examples. Um, there's an extensive history of fraud and theft, which were also common themes in the murder, uh, murders of all of the victims. Um, the defendant was involved with women outside of his marriage, including prostitutes, strippers, and online mistresses. He's got connecting MOs and similar patterns of behavior uh, throughout all of the crimes. There's evidence found in his Missouri storage unit um, that included many of the victims' belongings in documents such as driver's license, birth certificate, social security cards, government checks, photos, and other personal items. Um, then, of course, there's the obvious bodies found on um, the defendant's properties, both in Kansas and Missouri, identified as the missing victims. Uh, we have information obtained from the defendant's computer, including 17 different aliases that he went by, uh, matching those that uh, family members of the victims had reported hearing. Also, his computer contained victims' logins, emails that he had sent to, to their families, and the various connections to BDSM sites. Uh, there was also blood splatter found with the victim's DNA in the apartment, um, specifically Lewicka's apartment, linking her to the defendant. Um, victim Stacy's baby Tiffany was adopted to the Robinson family and was originally linked to the victim by footprint and later by DNA. Uh, the defendant was also under surveillance. They had wiretaps and did trash hits on his house, which also provided evidence linking Robinson to the victims. And then on a final note, it's um, 
it's important to keep in mind that no significant aggravating circumstances were noted that would lead the defendant to commit these crimes. For example, he had a normal family history, upbringing, background, etc. Now let's talk about the role of the defense in this case. The main goal of the defense um, is to show that there may be some reasonable doubt that the defendant committed these crimes or to seek a lesser punishment. Um, the evidence for the defense, they really did not have much to go on due to the overwhelming amount of evidence against him, but these are some arguments that they presented. Um, one being that Robinson had prior convictions of small-time financial fraud, but no prior history of homicide. Um, they also argued the consent of the victims involved in the BDSM as there were signed contracts, and it was clear that they had consented at, at some point in time to this activity. Um, judge, the judge ended up throwing out a sexual assault charge on Vicki Neufeld as the defense had created some reasonable doubt regarding her consent and um, because of the fact that there was not evident, enough evidence to prove um, the sexual assault on her. They also argued the idea of where there is no body, there is no crime, which was the case with three of the alleged victims, uh, so that made it a, a little bit more difficult to prove those three. Um, they argued that there had been a violation of the defendant's constitutional rights, um, because the police had illegally gone through his trash, or they argued that they had gone illegally through his trash. Um, they also argued that uh, there was a violation of Robinson's chance for a fair and impartial trial. Um, the defense even motioned for a change of venue due to the high media coverage and public awareness of the case in this area. However, the judge overturned this motion. And then finally, uh, they've been attempting to appeal the death penalty. Um, one of their arguments being that it can be considered cruel and unusual, unusual punishment as Robinson is now 72 years old and will likely be in his 80s at the time of the execution. However, so far the judge has overturned these appeals as well. Now let's talk about the expert witnesses in this case. Um, now the prosecution had a total of 110 witnesses uh, throughout the entire trial. However, we're just going to discuss um, some of the experts here. Um, so the first would be the medical examiners and the coroners. And we had one from Shawnee County Morgue and one from Jackson County. Uh, Donald Pullman of the Shawnee County Morgue in Kansas identified the first two bodies um, being that of Lewicka's and uh, Troughton's and the approximate time of death in years, as well as the cause of death, um, blunt force trauma to the head, and most likely by blitz attack either from behind or um, during sleep using um, an, a hammer-like object. Um, second, Thomas Young identified the remaining three bodies of Bonner, uh, Sheila Faith, and Debbie Faith, as well as the approximate time of death and the same manner of death as the first two. And then we've got two forensic chemists, Detective Sally Lane of the Johnson County Crime Lab and Detective Booth of the Kansas City 
Missouri Crime Lab. Uh, Detective Sally Lane was able to um, match some blood spatter found in Lewicka's apartment and identify it um, to Lewicka. Um, and because this apartment was being rented out by uh, Robinson, that's what created the connection between the two. And Detective Booth of Kansas City, Missouri matched, um, he was able to find some blood on a paper towel as well as eight hairs on a paper towel located in Robinson's mobile home and they matched that blood uh, to Troughton by DNA. Next we have uh, two forensic odontologists uh, again of Kansas and Missouri. Daniel Winter of Kansas confirmed that two of the bodies were those of Troughton and Lewicka. Um, by comparing their dental records. And Ronald Greer of Missouri confirmed uh, that one of the bodies was of Bonner, also using uh, dental records. And then we had a forensic fingerprint expert, Lila Thompson of Johnson County, who confirmed that uh, there were three fingerprints belonging to Robinson found on the barrels that were in the Missouri storage unit. And that's um, those are the main ones for the prosecution. The defense only had a total of uh, three witnesses, and uh, one of these experts was a forensic expert in design uh, and analysis of venue studies and jury selection procedures. So uh, this was Ronald DeLahey. He spoke on behalf of the defense regarding the likelihood of this venue and these jurors um, being impartial and possibly swayed by the media because there was so much um, high media coverage at this time uh, in this location. Finally, we've arrived at the convictions on the charges and the conclusion of the case. In January of 2003, after a one and a half uh, year prosecution, the longest in Kansas history, Robinson was found guilty on all counts. And if you recall, there are six of them that um, I'm mentioning here again. Count 1, aggravated kidnapping of Troughton, he received 246 months imprisonment. Count 2, intentional premeditated murder of Troughton, death penalty. Count 3, intentional premeditated murder of Lewicka, death penalty. Now counts 2 and 3 are connected as part of a common scheme to the murders of Bonner, Sheila Faith, and Debbie Faith, which I'll um, mention here in a little bit. Uh, count four, theft of Newfeld's property, seven months in prison. Count five, first degree premeditated murder of Stacy, life imprisonment. And count six, aggravated interference with Stacy's parental custody, uh, anywhere from 13 months to five to 10 years in prison, depending on um, guidelines. Now, to go back to that uh, common scheme. Uh, the four similar characteristics of the murders, which we discussed on a previous slide, slide number three, were used by the prosecution in a later court case to uphold the death penalty because they provided proof that Robinson had, quote, killed one or more persons as a part of a common scheme or during the same course of conduct, an action punishable by death. Um, and to conclude, Robinson is currently on death row in an El Dorado, Kansas prison. As we bring this presentation to a close, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the significance of this case. Um, firstly, it occurred in the state of Kansas, which happens to be my home state, so this is uh, why I chose this particular case. Also, it was one of the first internet serial killer cases in U.S. history. It was the longest prosecution in Kansas history, lasting one and a half years. It was the first death sentence given in Kansas since the reinstatement of the death penalty in the state in 1994. And the death sentence was re-examined in November 2005 and upheld once again for Mr. Robinson. Finally, this case was also of particular interest to me as one of the victims in the case, Lisa Stacy, was the aunt of a friend of mine, making baby Tiffany, who is now in her early 30s living somewhere, his cousin. A sad but very interesting little fact, in my opinion. With all the horror and tragedy of this case, you can't help but to wonder what caused this man to go from small-time fraud to brutally murdering so many people. 
and which came first his homicidal tendencies or his scheming lying manipulating ways either way due to the good work of the kansas and missouri law enforcement agencies we can now proudly say that this dangerous killer is off the streets for good yet no matter what fate has in store for him whether he gets the death penalty or not he will still fare better than his poor victims did but we will never forget the lives and the stories of these eight women paula lisa catherine beverly sheila debbie isabella and suzette May they rest in peace.